Well, Danny Breer certainly got his uh, GM tenureship kicked off uh, with a pretty big start, don't you think? Yeah, that was uh, that was something for me. The obviously Breer was the one pulling the, the levers and making all of this as the GM, but I was. It's funny with the timing of this, right? Because the Keith Jones is the new president of hockey operations in Philly, and so this trade happens on uh, on, on Tuesday, right? Yeah, it was a Tuesday, or was it Tuesday or Wednesday? And obviously, after Monday's the Stanley Stanley Cup final, and Keith Jones is still calling games because he's seeing out the end of his Turner contract to do games through the end of the final, and so the uh, <laughs> I. Uh, I just imagine. I, I just. I kind of picture like the, the the conversation between Briere and Jones of like at some point like during the final when they're, they're working on this trade. It's like Keith Jones like ignoring the hockey game because they're working on because he's texting with Danny about the trade or or maybe is there a, or is there a, there there's a maybe the flight on Tuesday and he's in the air and I, I just like to picture the the background of that where we have someone who. Not normally, and obviously once next season starts, Keith Jones will no longer be on the Turner broadcast. It was kind of one of those, the nature of the end of the, uh, but it was just kind of funny to see someone who's on TV as part of the public facing thing, who was probably also on the calls for pretty big trade in the, in the world in the middle of the cup final. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a really fascinating scenario to look at. And then when you just dig into the details of the trade, it's it's a shocking trade to pull off. And I think as a first-time GM making your first deal, I got to say that's a home run for Danny Breer. You moved a defenseman who has had kind of poor underlying impacts at even strength despite playing a lot of minutes, hasn't necessarily developed the way you were hoping he would have developed after the first you know season or two of his, that being Ivan Provorov. You move him without retaining any salary, move him through L.A., get L.A. to retain 30% of his salary, who then moves him to Columbus. And out of that, Philly walks away with a first, two seconds, a decent prospect in Helga Granz, a uh, big defense, big Swedish defenseman. Yeah, they got to take on Cal Peterson and Sean Walker's not necessarily much of a, a, a needle mover, but that's an unbelievable haul for moving away Ivan Provorov and not having to keep any of the salary on your books. Yeah. I mean, for Philly, it's, it's like, I, I really like obviously getting, getting, getting Provorov out and getting all of this value for him. And then I also, I just like the, to me, the only like for Philly, this is just trades a home run to me, this trade for LA makes a ton of sense. I wouldn't have, I would not have moved Granz if I was Philly. If I was LA, I know there was kind of the chatter of was it going to be a second, another pick, or was it going to be Granz. To me, for LA, I would have, you know, maybe there's something you like in this draft. But I'm always kind of the taking what you know. Like I think I remember seeing Granz. I think is depending on who you ask, is top second or third best prospect in the Kings pool was is probably a top hundred prospect in the NHL for the NHL right now. Like to me, I would have held on to that if I was LA, but so you're given a, if you're given trade grades, it's an A to Philly. It's a B plus to the Kings. I mean, getting out, like I was wondering like throughout this season, how are they going to get rid of the Peterson contract? Like this was going to be, this was always one of those things where it's like, how are they going to do this? What are they going to do? And then you go to Columbus and I don't know what you're doing. Like, this is the, like, this is, this is the guy you're going to move everything for. This is the guy you're going to make a big swing for when, why would you, I mean, I know he was a free agent. You would have had to resign him, but why wouldn't you have just not kept Gavrikov? Like, like if you're, if you're, if you're Columbus, I, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Like Philly, great job. Great job by Danny Briere. LA, good job getting out of a situ, a tough situation. You, you stuck the landing after the way things fell apart with Peterson, but Columbus, like, I mean, Columbus going full heel turn, right? This this off season, like Columbus going, like, can, I mean, I know Johnny Goudreau signed with Columbus, saying I want to be closer to home, I want to be in the Eastern Conference, but I'm not sure this was the uh, the line of uh, events that he probably would have laid out expecting to happen when he picked this franchise. Yeah, I mean, 
before I rip into Columbus, I want to I want to add kind of two things to your your Kings comments. I think one, this was a trade really only the Kings could have made. You know, they they need to clear that space of Peterson's contract in order to re-sign Gavrikov. They have a surplus of right-handed defensemen. I mean, Granz, while he may admittedly be their fourth or fifth best prospect in their pool, the guys ahead of him on the right side are Brant Clark and Jordan Spence. And so you have arguably two guys that are already going to be slotting ahead of him in terms of development. He is a surplus for you to be able to make that deal. It's This is arguably a deal only the Kings can make. And so, yeah, they can they can get a pass for what they did in terms of moving out Peterson to then sign Gavrikov and only having to take 30% of Provorov's deal. But what the hell is Columbus doing? I mean, I I have no idea what they're thinking here. I mean, it just constantly seems like one step forward, two steps back. You know, you, you escape Seth Jones. You find a way to bring Johnny Gaudreau in. Then you go out and deal Gavrikov. You get a decent haul for Gavrikov. But then you move the pick you got for Gavrikov to bring in a worse version of Gavrikov, albeit a little bit cheaper now that you got LA to retain 30% of it. But what are you doing? Like, I I have no idea what Yarmo Kekalainen is trying to accomplish here. Uh... But Columbus's trajectory makes absolutely no sense. It's this to me feels like the deal where when uh, like the Blue Jackets brought John Davidson back to the organization, right? Like, like th- when, when people talk about having a director of hockey operations, or like and we see that all over the place now, where Pittsburgh obviously hired Kyle Dubas to be a director of hockey operations, and and there'll be a GM under him, and we see kind of this spot and. We see Vegas has George McPhee as the director of hockey operations and Kelly McCrimmon is the GM. To me, the direct, the president or director of hockey operations, sorry, whatever terminology you want to use and what they have in Philly with, with Keith Jones, to me, their job is to be the yes or the no man, right? Like their, their job is supposed to be the per, like to me, this is one of those where you're at Mokakalina and sit, gives, uh, John Davidson a call up and says, Hey, look, we're going to make this trade and says, why? And <laughs> and I, I don't get I really don't get what Columbus is doing here. And it's you're right, it's perfect. One step forward, two steps back. I mean, you look at that team and you're like, okay, you 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 have all this energy and this 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 like this this goodwill from one of the biggest free agents picking you. And you know what? If the lottery balls hop another way, maybe you've got him playing with with a with a generational player and then you do this trade and then you go and hire a coach that is basically uh has is <laughs> is basically that you technically won't hire till the end of the month cuz he's still making 6.25 million for from the Toronto Maple Leafs until till June 30th it's it's a crazy crazy world out there but you know folks you have it Philly did good LA did fine. Columbus, what the hell are you thinking? And with all that being said, folks, welcome to Expected by Whom, a podcast exploring the world of hockey through unique lenses, brought to you by the Wing Wheel Podcast. We know a lot of you tuning in are Red Wings fans, and the Wing Wheel Podcast is the biggest and best Detroit Red Wings show out there. Find the show wherever you listen to or watch your podcasts and go to wingwheelpodcast.com for more. So, Sean, you know, we've been going, we're now, what, eight episodes in? This is episode nine. Uh, we've had a lot of interesting guests on. We've had a lot of fun discussions, but we figured we'd turn this episode back to everybody listening and and kind of do more of a mailbag episode, collect some questions, see what people are thinking. We'll pick back up sort of with the guests and and interviews starting next week, but really wanted to give you guys an opportunity to to ask some questions if you had some. And so I know a few of y'all chimed in on Twitter with some questions for us. And so Without further ado, we'll uh, we'll get into those. Yeah, it's it'll be fun because we, I mean, we, you and I were texting about this. It's something where we've had some really good guests, we've had some good con- con- uh, concepts and things we've tackled and everything like that. But obviously, as we did talk about episode one, this show is for for the people and trying to connect a top some topics that are not always um, 
the most easily digestible or maybe new to people. And so that's 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 where we're going with this today. So we got we got a good amount of questions here. Um, you want me to start with the first one, or you want to you want to read the first one? Why don't you uh, Why don't you start with the first one that you picked? As uh, I'm gonna skip yeah. through them now here to to catch up. Yeah. Um, let's uh, let's go with uh, I think uh, Brian Bastian had a pretty good one, um, and it's kind of it reminds me a little bit of our conversation we had with uh, Eric Tolsky last week, just kind of on on talking about public models versus things. But Brian, when Brian had a couple questions, but the first one was. Um, if you have experience with seeing it, what are the biggest differences in public models in something like sport logic? I've seen some odd inconsistencies. Yeah, the context for this question is it's come up, you know, a lot with how we measure Sergey Bobrovsky. And obviously you and I, we spent a lot of time talking about Bobrovsky's performance uh, a couple episodes ago. And then throughout the interviews, we've gotten some insight from folks on the public side and folks on the private side in terms of what the gaps really are between public and private models. I personally don't have any experience working with sport logic or Stathlete data. I have not, um, you know, been privy to seeing that, but I do think uh, one of the comments made by Eric Tulski on our episode last week that I thought was particularly illuminating pun very much intended uh, was he, he sort of equated what the data looks like in the public side versus what they have available on the private side by saying, you know, on the public side, we have about one event on the play-by-play every 10 seconds. So imagine you get to turn the light on in your room one time every 10 seconds, and that's all you get. And it's not going to be a consistent one every 10 seconds. Sometimes you might get two or three flickers uh, in a span, and then you may go 30 seconds without being able to flip on the light. And what public models attempt to do is take the best glimpses they get from that light being on and use that to approximate what happened the rest of the game um, and use that as, to ascribe benefit. And it's very powerful what those models can do. You know, all of the public models you know, really have been tremendous over the years. Uh, but what Eric was sort of alluding to was on the private side, now with the tracking data, now instead of flicking the light on one time every 10 seconds on average, you're getting 10 data points every second. And you have so much more information to work with. That being said, I think there's two important notes that I would personally bring up when that comes to. One is more information isn't necessarily better. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's more that it's useful. It doesn't mean it's useful in a linear fashion where as you accumulate more and more and more, you're going to get better by X percent. Uh, just because you have more information doesn't mean uh, that your model is going to perform all that much better. We want to believe that, but we don't often know how much more that information is adding. The second piece is... The information is only as good as the person handling it. And this comes down to a lot of the comments when we see, oh, analytics say this, analytics say that. Analytics actually don't say anything, right? They are numbers, they're stats, but they're generated by analysts. The better the analyst is, the more they've sort of considered and thought about when it goes, you know, when they're generating these metrics or these numbers. And... You know, the same information could be given to all 32 teams and you'll get different outputs because of the people that are working with them. And so what I just like to say is in the public space, we have a lot of really tremendous people working here. Um, You know, the Evolving Hockey Twins we've had on, Micah we've had on, hope to have more folks on, you know, down the road. We've obviously had Dom Lucision on. They're all tremendously, you know, gifted people and, and ultimately that extra information is only as good as the people that are using it. It's, it's like the, uh, it's like the space too, where it's, I, I wrote something about this this week with, with Vegas and how one of the big stories about Vegas is money. And it's not necessarily the cap. And I know but it's, it's easy to look like, cause I always hate the comparison where people be like, Oh, it's a cap team. They spit, Every every good every owner spends to the cap. You're either you're either spending. You're either if you're trying to win, you're spending to the cap. If you're tanking, you're not. They're, those are the those are the two differences. So I always hate when people talk about like, oh, that's a good owner. They spend to the cap. I, I hate that answer. The um, but the 
like Vegas, one of the stories to me about Vegas is how they spend the money that are outside the cap plate, how it's you pay more to the AHL goalie coach, you pay more to your support staff, you pay more where people will consider coming for a quote unquote lesser position, but for more money to work in Vegas than they would work in, 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 in and that they would maybe make in a similar role in or another organization. Or um, like I talked to Ivan Barbashev about this last week at NH Stanley Cup Media Day, how there's, and it's funny because he didn't mention the St. Louis Blues by name, but he's only played in one other organization. So, <laughs> but he mentioned like how, just like how appreciative he was of all the things and things that he would get that you could get in Vegas as far as if a player requests something and how easy the answer is always yes compared to other places he's played. And he, he only he only played one other place. So it's but he didn't say the blues by name, so who knows? Maybe maybe he's talking about Moncton or something like that. But the um, but to me it's 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 so it's 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 just like money and data are very similar. It's not how much you have, it's how you use it, right? Um kind of on a similar thing, and I want to give one more question to Brian, because Brian asked a couple, but the second one I want to go into, because I have a perspective, I have a different perspective than you coming from this, I think, just because um, you're going to be able to give the more technical perspective. I'm going to be able to give a little bit more of the human perspective on this, I believe. Um, your thoughts on uh, for, expe for expected goals during a flurry of shots, should it be accumulative? Should it be weighted? How do you look at uh, for a flurry of shots on that? And I want to hear your thought on this first, then I have a thought of this as someone who still attempts to play goalie in beer league on, on, on Wednesday nights. Yeah, it's a it's a tremendous question. And so to start, we should lay the context of what flurry really means. Um, and so we haven't yet had Peter Tanner on who runs Money Puck, but this flurry adjusted expected goals comes from uh, an idea that Basically, the second, the third, the fourth shots in a sequence of shots that happen in a rapid succession, those shots shouldn't necessarily all be counted as the same likelihood of going in because those shots are really only happening or the opportunity to happen uh, because the team didn't score in the previous shot. And so what it does is it sort of discounts or diminishes the value of each subsequent shot in succession uh, as opposed to evaluating it in isolation. And so if you go to the Money Puck website, um, Peter Tanner has a bunch of examples with video and showing you how, you know, some of those shots have been discounted versus counting each shot in isolation, which is what Brian means by accumulative. My personal perspective is, you know, flurry adjustments, I think, make sense in some cases, but not all cases. And cumulative adjust, you know, counting it cumulatively makes sense in some cases, but not all cases. And it's sort of, it's a challenge because you you sort of have to pick one way or another based on the data we have available to analyze this as a whole. And, you know, I don't know that there's necessarily one way that's going to be demonstrably better. Now, Peter notes in, in his presentation from the Vancouver Hockey Analytics Conference that the flurry adjusted expected goals were found to be more repeatable, meaning year after year, you were more likely to see those. Um, and they were also more predictive of, of future winning than just looking at the cumulative expected goals. However, I do think there are some differences in expected goals models between a lot of the different sites that may allow for one model to be a little bit you know, more descriptive compared to the others and more predictive compared to the others. So I will give a cop-out answer and say they're both good, but neither is perfect. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you be the expert on that part because you've actually worked a little bit more directly on that space directly. But I want to come in from the space where to me, I look at flurry and I look at space like that. And to me, I look at this as a tool almost where I, I think if you're doing something over the course of a season, I think it's probably makes more sense to do just cumulative as soon as it's diminishing, just because I think you start to get too far into the weeds. But I do think from a, in a, if you're looking at breaking something down into a game or an individual standpoint, that's where it becomes more interesting because it shows, it tells a little bit more of a story of the game. It tells, um, it maybe tells you a story about, okay, hey, this is how this how well this team tracked track down second second and third shot opportunities. This is how well this team maybe got to the net. Or maybe even the more telling thing about the opposition of 
you know what? Maybe his rebound control was shit. Like, maybe, like, like, cause that could be, that's something too, where, so I look at this just from coming, coming kind of the goalie lens and coming at it from this perspective of, I think overall, I think it's, I don't think we want to diminish those, right? Just thinking aloud because I think it's, it makes sense to get a larger, I don't want to try to be breaking down. I want, I think things start to even out when you get large enough sample size. But when you're working with an individual game and you're working with a small case, I think it can help you tell a little bit better story of the game and and do it that way. That's kind of where I come at I come at this one. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, it's and, and that's where I think I, I end up coming back to, you know, you, you sort of looking at it from a whole season versus individual game standpoint. It, it, it sort of ties into what I'm thinking in terms of, there are some scenarios where it is going to be maybe a little more impactful to use those flurry adjusted expected goals. And then there's going to be some scenarios where you sort of want to count every shot individually. And, you, you know, in all likelihood, you're probably right that over the course of a season, it's going to all even out. It's going to wash out to where cumulative is probably the way to go. And we've talked about it previously that the evolving hockey model, you know, they don't flurry adjust. Um, their, their expected goals model is often one of the best at actually matching the total number of goals scored each season, um, thereby being a very good descriptive model. Uh, so I think there are ways to get there to capture it. There's going to be some scenarios that make sense to use one, some scenarios that make sense to use the other, but I don't think either one is a uh, is perfect for all situations. Yep, I agree all with right. that. Yep, I agree with that. Let's, you want to take uh, the uh, next question? Yeah, yeah. Let's hit the next question, and I've got – I've got one that I'm going to spin a little bit that I still okay. think holds the the kind of the crux of the question, but it's from at Joe D113. The question here reads, you know, since Lalone came in, Larkin's 5-5, five and five, ice time is down, He's but he's on the PK to balance it out, as you would expect, 5-5 five and five goals are down, but the PK is better. As the wings get better, should they pull Larkin off? Uh, or continue with other teams and put top talent on the PK. So the crux of what I want to pose to you is we've seen a little bit of a trend of teams putting their star players or maybe their gifted offensive players on the penalty kill. You know, we've seen this in particular with Carolina, Sebastian Ajo and Tevo Teravine and played a lot of PK time. Um, and, you know, they did a tremendous job with it. We've seen other scenarios where other teams have put their skilled players uh, to, to kill penalties. Mitch Marner is obviously another example in Toronto. What do you think about that concept of putting skilled players on the PK? I, I like it a lot if the player is defensively reliable. Like there's certain players that I would, there's certain players who they are pure, they're pure goal scorers. They're, they're, they're really don't, they're not good defensively. I don't want that player on the penalty kill, but if a player is if a player is one of your most elite players and skilled and he can do the job, you should do it. I'm, I'm a big proponent of put the best people in the best position. Um, like, for example, and I mean, it's one of the reasons he always gets the most underrated player in the NHL stuff. But like, could you imagine the Florida Panthers not using Barkov on the penalty kill because because he's a quote unquote skilled player? Like, so I'm a big I'm a big proponent of if Dylan Larkin, to use the Detroit example, if Dylan Larkin is one of your best penalty killers and he gives you the best chance to win the game in those minutes, then yes, I I, I think that's I think that's all for it. I think there's some nuance that can be applied when when it comes to to workload and and stuff like that. But I'm the I'm a big believer in if you have a good power play you shouldn't be working hard on the power play. Like I, I know coaches say like, like the net front guy is probably working hard, but like in theory, power play minutes should not be zapping much energy, right? It's, it's a lot of aside from the entry, it's a lot of half, half court. It should be not be zapping your energy. Um, so I don't like when, so if a guy's got, if you're taking five on five time away and you're distributing it to the penalty kill, I'm fine with that. Like to me, if I were a coach and if I'm Derek Lalonde shoes and I look at Dylan Larkin and what, what was Larkin's time on ice this year? What was it like? Do you, do you have that in front of you? I think he was around 21 minutes if yeah. I remember correctly. So, so for me, if I'm, I want Dylan Larkin playing 20, I, that's kind of where I, I would want Dylan Larkin playing 21, 22 minutes a night. If that means he's playing, 
because I feel like I'm a better team when Dylan Larkin is on the ice. If that means playing 21 minutes of five on five, fine. But if the, but if that means if that means that um, there's going to be two minutes of shorthanded time, that's fine too. To me, it's all about not getting overly caught up in let's save five on five time. Like I don't want you to take away five on five time because of penalty because because of uh, because we might take a penalty later. As long as within the game you're just working towards how do we have Dylan Larkin on the ice twenty to twenty two minutes a night. As long as you're working that way with that process in mind, I don't care whether it's power play penalty penalty kill or even strength because I think the more time your best one of your best players is on the ice, the more time you're winning the game. That's how I, I look at that. Yeah, I think it's really interesting question um and to to clarify larkin was at 1933 uh this past season which was in line with where he was the year before uh and so you've again you know sean your point is valid in terms of about 20 minutes a night i i've taken two approaches to this over the years Um, one of the first big analyses i did in hockey I think this probably goes back to 2015 or 2016 was looking at the utilization of skill players on the PK and how that impacted results. And what I found in that analysis going all the way back, back, you know, almost eight years now was that teams would often sneak those skill players on the ice on the fly. They wouldn't start them in the defensive zone where if you lose the face off, you've got to then chase and play heavy, you know, minutes, blocking shots, things like that. What they would do is they would, after the puck was cleared, they would then get the skill player on the ice to go four check and then defend the entry, where potentially they're a little bit less taxing minutes if you can force a turnover in the neutral zone. And what that ultimately led to is those forwards were having fewer you know, shot attempts against, they were actually able to generate more chances. And sort of from there, we've had the term the power kill evolve that's really been popularized by Allison Lucan, Megan Hall, Mike Fail. And I think it's, I think there's two sides to the coin. I do believe that having skill players on the ice, particularly coming on on those on the fly shifts, is a beneficial thing. They're going to be better at chasing down, you know, the 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 puck they're going to be better at that four check they're going to be better at disrupting passes reading plays through the neutral zone and then capitalizing on any opportunities they may get to go the other way that being said i do think there is a diminishing return from having them play those tougher minutes and this isn't something that i used to hold as a belief but i'm coming around to now when we think about load management and what we're seeing in the NBA in terms of making sure your players are getting adequate rest. And if your player's only going to get 20 minutes on the ice, do I really want them in those situations where those minutes are potentially more taxing and tougher? Those block shots add up, you know, having to chase the play and being gassed adds up. This is where I wonder if you had the ability to sort of get biometric data that was correlated to uh, you know, a player's recovery time, as we're always talking about. Um, I think that would be very interesting information to have. And potentially some training staffs do have this, like, you know, how long it takes a particular player to recover. And that may help you optimize deployment. But I, I think there's a there's a balance to it. If you're going to get them on, I think get them on on the fly, not having to start off by defending in the zone. And then from there, you know, make sure you are fine tuning it so that those minutes that they're on the ice are minutes where they get to play with the puck. And it's not so much chasing the game when you could potentially have a trade off of somebody else doing it. Who's maybe not demonstrably like demonstrably worse. That's really, I mean, that's a really good context to put to it. And I think that's the, the sneak on the, on the fly, the power kill. Like, I think that's really when you talk about Larkin, that is the way he should be used if it's, if it's shorthanded, right? Um, it's 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 interesting with me for, for when you look at kind of it, it's interesting how this applies. Forwards are because you can sneak forwards on, right? The it's 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 not like it's not like you're typically with defenders. You're typically all in or all out. You're not really 
sneaking you're not sneaking a defender on for this so with the forwards you have that flexibility it's like the um it's why i like some teams will do the um and I, i'm just gonna use a dallas example dallas example because i covered dallas for so long for a long time the stars penalty kill evolved where they would have you would have two basically it was you had Radic Foxa was taking was always taking the first draw, and you had a second guy out there who would take who was red who was who was also a pretty good face off guy. If Dallas won the if Dallas lost the draw, that was the four. But if Dallas won the draw, the other there was a quick change, literally as part of the design, literally to create a four check almost like as as a bump off the bench. So I it's I think there's a the on the fly, the sneaking them on is a good way to, is a good really important context point you bring up. And you're right. You don't want you don't want your your captain who's making more money than anyone else on the team standing there and having shots blasted against his hands and potentially having uh, injury. So I that's that's good. Yeah, and I mean, even going to your your Dallas example, um, you know, they they still follow that to a certain extent with Luke Lindenning, uh, you know, being another guy who can take those faceoffs. But if you look at sort of the guys who were you know, five and six for them in, in penalty kill time. It's Tyler Sagan, right, being able to sneak on and Jamie Ben being able to sneak on. And so it's like you are finding ways to get those guys on the ice. And that's where I think the scenario makes sense to use those those skill players. They're not necessarily tough minutes, particularly in the second period where you're, you know, your bench is right there to to immediately hop on the ice and, uh, you know, chase the play and, and, and be able to chase from behind. I think that offers – you know, some really interesting opportunities. But ultimately, I, I do think there's there's something to be said about the recovery rates for these athletes. You obviously want those guys out in scenarios where they can do more with the puck. So it's it just, it's a big trade-off. I'm also interested to just see Larkin's usage just as this roster evolves too, because there's going to be, some players are going to, grow into better roles. So I'm interested to see what Larkin becomes by um, by either luxury or necessity as we see what happens with this team as looking at various developments and things like that. I think he's just a fascinating case because we know what he is and his role is obviously going to be the captain of this team. He's going to play a lot. He's here for the next eight years. But how what space he needs to step into is very is going to be is going to evolve with how the wings players that they already have develop and some of the other moves that Eisenman makes. So it's, he's a really interesting case study that we can probably we'll probably could talk about his ice time and his usage and everything almost on an annual basis to see almost that can kind of sort of reflect what the roster looks like. Yeah, without a doubt, you know he'll be a measuring stick for the success of this team moving down the road because. Ultimately, as he starts to age a little bit more, uh, he's a guy that's going to – his role is really going to evolve as as the season sort of continues. And, uh, you know, this is the this is the kind of context that I think will be very interesting to see. You know, we've seen this happen in other organizations where, you know, sort of the best player kind of passes that mantle on. I mean, again, you know, coming back to the Dallas example, we've gone from it being Jamie Benn and Tyler Sagan, and we watched Jamie Benn's role evolve because now – You've got a different top line, you know, with Jason Robertson that is unbelievable. And he's sort of the guy that's carrying you offensively. And, and, and you've had a switch a little bit in terms of what's expected uh, from the captain. And, and so we will, uh, you know, we'll certainly see how that evolves for Dylan Larkin. And another thing, you know, is we'd like to see you guys watch our show evolve. So if you'd like to support our show, subscribe to the Wing Wheel Podcast on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash wing wheel podcast by subscribing you're not only unlocking more great benefits like wing wheel podcast exclusive discord which has an expected by whom dedicated channel bonus episodes and more you're also supporting us as we're a part of the wing wheel podcast content network so sean let's take a let's take a couple more questions here um any other good ones stand out to you um yeah let's take a look um i think i did want to bring up uh so i thought luke uh mr walt at mr walt 89 um said do so-called fancy stats exist for draft eligible players or is it the basic stats that are available and you and i had talked before about how inconsistent these are but i do want to i did want to use this as a chance to plug something one of the 
one of the places that I do some work for in the Mexico is the is Elite Prospects and EP Rink site and our massive fourteen thousand fourteen hundred sorry fourteen hundred word draft guide is out right now and if if you, if you really you want to really nerd out on prospects like go get that it's really good um, and it's such a great tool it'll it, it's it's such a great tool to have when on draft day to have it open. And then just hitting Control F on a guy's name when they get picked, and to go go through and all that. But one of the things that's great that we that they we some staff we have over at Elite Prospects with their, is your work. It's it's once again it's we're talking we use that light switch example. It's a very simple. It's not a ton, but we've got um, but Mitchell Brown and and Lassie Allen and they they do a really good job of hand tracking and trying to create some sort of standardized data where they're looking at control rates and they're looking at, at, at offensive zone retrievals and they're looking at um, expected goals and expected shots, trying to track it basically at 5v5 by hand. And now it's it's a very limited data set. So it's like, for example, I'm, I've got the draft guide up right here. And if I go to Jaden Perron, they've tracked a, nine games of Jaden Perron, obviously not the sample size an NHL team would have. But if you want a taste of it, a 10 game sample size, you can look at it there. So it does um, the underlying analytics and, and there's some places where like, if you go to Instat, you can find uh, which, which I've, I've looked into, you can, you can see some of theirs. It's, there are some analytics. There are some, there are some spaces where there it's, it's once again, it's hard to standardize because it's how do you properly compare the expected goals for a kid in the USHL versus a kid playing in, in especially like, especially this year where it's hard to watch the games in Russia. Right. Like, so it's, it's, there's standardization is difficult. Um, but there is something and, but it's on a public level, it's even harder to get because we're still just kind of dipping our toe into what we're getting on the public service on the NHL level. And, um, the, the prospect level and everything like that. It's, there's still a lot to go, to go on that space. So um, that was, uh, that's how I kind of wanted to answer that one. So I'll let you see if you had anything more. Yeah. It, you know, we should probably spend uh, a larger part of an episode, maybe closer to the draft, talking a little bit more about draft analytics and, and kind of what's available. We, we tackled this a little bit in the very first episode of the show where, you know, exactly like you said, Sean, there's there's some information available. It's inconsistent across leagues. That's why you've seen a lot of people try and use NHL E or NHL equivalency, which attempts to standardize scoring across all the leagues by adjusting for, you know, the quality of a league. So, for example, if the KHL for every point you score in the KHL, it's worth 0.6 points in the NHL. Um, and you can p- attempt to, to make comparisons across leagues that way. Um, but ultimately it is very inconsistent in terms of what's available publicly. And, and thus we can't really make sweeping data driven, you know, comments about specific prospects aside from the manually tracked data that we get from people like, you know, Will Scouch, like we get from people like, uh, you know, Mitch Brown and, and Lassie Allen and. Yeah, let's uh, let's 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 go. Let's stick let's pivot this to a Red Wings question, and I'll throw this one to you to answer. So, from Benjamin Fair, is Mo Sider a top fifteen defenseman in the NHL if you look at his underlying numbers? Uh, short answer is no, uh, not right now. We're talking about a guy who has played two seasons in the NHL. Yes, he's very very good. Um, but he hasn't done what, and you know, in those two seasons that we've seen guys like Kill McCarr, you know, Mira Haskinen and other, other folks that are maybe a notch above him do just yet. I do think Mo needs a little bit more talent around him, uh, for him to really flourish and shine. Uh, but I don't think at this point in time, if you're asking me to rate the top 15 defensemen in the NHL, he's one of the first 15 I'm taking. Now, if you change the question and say, okay, from this point forward, you get, one of these defensemen for the next eight years, then Mo is in that conversation for sure. But if you're asking me right now, somebody to take just for next season, um, I don't think he's one of the top 15 defensemen. You know, and when we talk about looking at underlying numbers, what does that mean? Well, I think it means something different to everybody. You know, you could look at 
their five on five expected goals uh, four percentage. You could look at just the expected goals against when they're on the ice. Uh, you could look at their their goals above replacement or their expected goals above replacement. You could look at you know the isolated threat percentage from Micah's hockey viz. There's so many different things you could look at, but. In the crux, me as an analyst digesting all of those numbers, I don't believe at this point in time he's top 15. I think he's probably in that top 25 range. Um, but moving forward, I do think he would be one of the top 15 defensemen in the NHL if I'm just picking somebody to have for the next eight years. It's it, it's kind of defensemen, and it's it's the... I think Charlie O'Connor had a pretty good line about this when he was writing about the, the Provorov trade. Like, defenseman value is all over the place. De- trades for defensemen are more about, I think Charlie's word was vibes. It's t- trades for defensemen are more about vibes and feelings than hard analytical, what people think is cold, right? Because it's, it's the position that is, has evolved and changed. Um, like I saw a great, um, I saw, I saw a great quote the other day from, I, I'm ashamed that I can't remember what coach said it, but I, off to, but someone was basically if you want a picture of how well a coach a team is coached and how much the game has changed, just watch their um, their their uh, weak side defenseman throughout the game and watch watch them throughout the game. Where that's a spot where forever it was if you were the weak side defenseman, you did nothing in the play. You were basically just a traffic like like not in a, not in a bad way. You just you didn't have a job. You were the weak side defenseman. You just stood there. And now the weak side defenseman, depending on the team, depending on the system, depending on, on, on that type of player, they all, they have a job, but it's very nuanced and it's different. And you, we see the way teams build their defensive course. And in Vegas is George McPhee and Kelly McCrimmon. While it's not the, well, like they're not bringing out a ruler before trading for guys. I mean, there's a reason they don't have a, this, the shortest defenseman in Vegas. They have everyone is six, five of the six or six two or higher, six two or taller. They're, they they incredibly believe in in that length in, in building a system where having having that blanket that that length and it's why Vegas was blocked more shots, third most shots in NHL history this year because. They build off that length and that structure where other teams are more willing to have a smaller, more mobile defenseman. I think what a good defenseman is, is the, um, to me, it's the, and I know I'm like, you look at the way, and I, I don't think, I think hockey's too traditionalist where we'll never get away fully from the three forward to defenseman quote unquote lineup. But I, I think the way you look, at soccer and you look and you look you look at soccer and you look at the way where a team can line up anywhere from a 3-4-3 to a 5-4-1 to a 4-4-2 where teams are using defensemen in different roles and, and everything like that and i think because of the line changes and we don't have a lineup it's it's it, we can't isolate it as easily looking at a team but i think we're getting more and more to the spot where for some teams it's more of almost like a Four. It's almost. It's almost like three forwards and a midfield. A mid, like I like a like a midfielder and a defender. For some teams, it's it's more of when when certain lines are on the ice, they've got a center that draws so far back. It's almost more like two forwards and three defensemen. And I I, I think kind of the role of the defenseman is like we should definitely have it. We should act. This is this would be a great topic to do an entire show on to a have a active NHL defenseman on and then B bring on someone look at a little more analytically like just how the defenseman what it what's important in a defenseman varies by all 32 different organizations and it's a position that is not easily black and white defined forward obviously you have different roles but it's still at the end of the day it really boils down to score more goals than the other team. That's really what forward boils down to. Goalie really boils down to don't let the puck in the net. What a defenseman jobs is, I think if you asked, there would be 32 different jo- thirty two different answers if we asked 32 different head coaches. Omar. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic point to bring up because in the crux of evaluating defensemen, I think we have to remember that what we can measure publicly from the play-by-play is offensively slanted. You know, things that are not going to show up in the play-by-play are denials, 
you know, of zone entries, uh, you know, being able to make a hit that separates from the puck that's not going to show up versus just being defined as a hit. And yeah, over time, once you accumulate a large enough sample size, you'll see that, yeah, okay, when this guy's on the ice, there's fewer shots, you know, against them. But we have to remember that there are roles and instructions given to these players that we're not able to capture and that ultimately the data we have is offensively slanted. So defensemen that are not playing that, you know, midfielder role as you you described it may not grade as highly as, you know, others and that that becomes a little bit tougher to to do. And so Mo has sort of had to do a little bit of in between between being asked to go you know, play a little bit more offense and generate more from the back end to having to cover a little bit more for his partner and having to play a little more defensive minded. So I think it becomes a tough question to answer based on what we have available. I, I will say that, and I, and I don't all, I think worlds is always very weird because it's like, it's a combination of worlds is always, it's a combination of prospects versus guys who missed the playoffs versus um, some AHL guys who are getting opportunity. They normally wouldn't, but, um, uh, for some of those smaller countries, you get to see like normally I don't read much into worlds and everything like that. But I real watching watching Cider play. I think I watched about two or three of the Germany games, but just watching him play and seeing him kind of take that lead dog dominant role on that German team to me that was that's something where I think that to me is a good indication when you talk about the. Here's the keeper, the keeper draft of I want to win a cup in eight years. I want to within the next years. I want to build someone for the long term. Those to me are all the good signs that that point that way. But as as we said, like right now, both from what we see and both what you, when you look at data and you try to figure out things out, he's not a top fifteen defenseman in the NHL right now. But that's he's only in his second year of his. He's only just finished the second year of his career. That's also not something to hold against him either. Exactly. Like there's very few defensemen. You can say that by the end of the second year uh, in the league, they are a top 15 defenseman already in the league. So it is not a knock on him. I think he will absolutely get there. And I think part of it is he just needs a little bit more talent and support around him because there's only so much, uh, you know, a player can do when, when they don't have that much around them, particularly on the defensive end, there's only, so much you can do in terms of getting the puck up to your forwards. And there's only so much you can do to help the goalie behind you. But ultimately you need the other, you know, five guys on the ice to help you out uh, a, a little bit. So I think he gets there. I'm not sure that he's there yet, but it should be, should be soon enough. And so, you know, with all that being said, let's, uh, let's maybe take one more of the questions here uh, to, to wrap us up. Sean, you feel like talking about plus minus? <laughs> You mean the the grandfather? I think I I think I called it the grandfather advanced stats. So uh, I think you did. Yeah. So, so, so we yes, got a great yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we got a question in from Nick Lebert, uh That's at n underscore l o u b e r t. Uh, you know, asking why why do people hate plus minus? Like obviously, you know, I get playing on a good team or even a good line can inflate the stat and vice versa. But looking at it relative to teammates and even line mates seems like it would be very insightful. Yeah, I mean, I, we we talked about this on episode one, I think, and I have I look at plus minus as the kind of the stat that was before its time, but wasn't didn't go far enough, so it gets hate on both sides. Where there's uh, there if you're if you're you're deep into analytics and and you were one of the people like this this wasn't enough, so it plus minus isn't enough, so people. And then there's, and then it, it kind of got lumped in with everything else. When people who will look at the game and be like, "Oh, you got to watch the game. It's not all about that." To to me, plus minus is very similar to, to it's very similar to Corsi actually. Like I look at it where it's, um, it's something where I think plus minus if you using it, trying to use it on a daily basis and and, and everything like that gets very tricky and starts to fuzz up your knowledge of a game and i think it should be something where like it's funny because like people will be like oh well this guy was dash three in this game and or there are plus three whatever that's that's a great starting point but it so it can be definitely be used as a starting point where say you're watching the um um say you're watching the florida vegas series and 
I don't know, say um, Michael Amadio, just to pick a random name out of a hat. And like Michael Amadio has zero points, but you see him plus three in the game. Like, okay, now I'm going to go try to see, okay, what did, did Michael Amadio, was Michael Amadio actually impacting that plus three or was it too late changes and, uh, or, or did he, or, or was it, was it two kind of plays where he jumped in or, or whatever, right? So I don't, I don't think plus minus deserves all the hate that it gets. I think it's just, the reality is there are simply better standardized tools that we can use. And I think that's how, that's where it is. Now it's, it's something where it's as a quick entry point, as the quick kind of into a player and everything like that, it should be used in that. It, it can be used like that. But I, I, I honestly, I don't hate it because I don't, I, I think it's another data point, but I also don't base an entire player's value on it for, it's one of those where, large sample size tells me large sample size is going to tell me is going to give me a better idea from other data. Um, now on the quick kind of on that other end, we talked about prospects earlier. We talked about leagues below, like in, in other leagues where there is less standardized data, it's one of the better things we actually have to figure out whether a guy is on the ice at even strength when good or bad things happen. Um, and like, for example, um, I don't know who, but like, exactly, I know. Uh, so in the Idaho, who just beat uh, the Toledo in the in the conference final, they're playing Florida. They had a play. They had a defenseman who was like plus forty eight or whatever this year, like, and named, named Matt Register, who was like plus forty eight. I've other than watching when Idaho played Toledo, I don't watch much of the ECHL just to be other than for other than watching goalies and seeing how Sebastian Cosa looks, but. I now know, okay, when the Idaho Steelheads had one of the best seasons, regular seasons in history, Matt Register was on the ice for most of the se- for most of the season. I'm now going to take a deeper look of, was it because, was he a driving factor for that? Or was he, not a passenger, but was he some, was he kind of benefiting from being on a, on a better team? It's used as an entry point, used as a data point, but also don't, make it an end all be all. And it's also not something to worth. It's not, I, I hate when I do hate when my biggest hate on plus minus is when it gets as like a throwaway stat in a story. Like you'll read something, especially you'll read a story where someone will like put as a throwaway stat of like, Oh, he, he was, he was, he was, the, he was plus this or whatever. Like I hate when it's a throwaway stat in the story. Cause it's a stat that needs more context to me. Totally agree with that. You know, when you when you think about, uh, you know, the question that Nick has here, I think there's two important things that you brought up, one being the sample size. Um, and with sample size, we know that goals happen at sort of random. There, there, there's, there's a lot of randomness that goes to goals. And so with plus minus being tied to goals in small samples, you know, the puck hits somebody in the back of the knee and redirects and goes in the net. And that's that everybody on the ice there gets a minus. And that's, that kind of sucks. And so if you look at it just over that one game or even a couple of games, that minus kind of carries heavily. Um, and so in those smaller samples, it's not particularly helpful in terms of really ascribing blame or, or success to a particular individual. Now over larger samples, take the entire career of somebody you know, we we know it's going to generally indicate players that were were good, right? Your all time leader in plus minus, Larry Robinson. He was very very good. You know, right up there with him, Bobby Orr. Like we know that we know that they're very good. You know, Wayne Gretzky's up there, Nick Lidstrom's up there. Those are those are very good hockey players. We know that, and over the course of their career, we had enough time to see that add up. The other knock that I think happens with plus minus is the way it's calculated. Um, can sort of penalize people that are on the ice in certain situations. So if you are on the ice, end of game, your team is trailing by one, you give up an empty net goal, you get a minus. That kind of sucks, right? And, you know, you're on the ice trying to chase for this offense here. All of a sudden, an empty net goal goes in, you're on for a minus. You're playing on the power play, and, you know, you, your your team gives up a shorthanded goal. You get a minus. Um, you know, so... 
that's a little bit of the issues there. So if you really want to use something that is goal-based to be able to compare relative to teammates and line mates, as Nick mentioned, just use five-on-five goals for a percentage. It removes the the situations that are kind of extraneous from that, and that at least allows you to compare a little bit more, uh, a little bit more closely. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, I just it's just not enough in that small sample to really make it impactful. When, like you said, we've got other stats that have a little bit more weight to them. The yeah, how it's how it's monitors is is a big one for me too because I I, I don't like that we only turn it off for power play. We only turn it off if a team scores on the power play. If you let up a sh- if you score a shorthanded goal, you get a plus, but the power play gets a minus. But if you score on the power play, it doesn't do any. Like it's it's one of those where it doesn't. It's 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 a very choosy stat. Like it should be, uh, but like to me, a perfect example of of this of all of this is to just like how plus minus can be so i'm gonna give you okay one let's see let's see make sure these both have a pretty close in term so i'm gonna name two players and you're gonna tell me and you're gonna say okay one player has a minus 40 career plus minus the other has a plus this has a plus 71 has a plus 71 for his career. One minus 40, one plus 71. If I just give you those two numbers, you'll say, oh, like, which guy would you take? Which guy would you take? The the minus 40 or the plus 71? Well, you know, that's a pretty easy one there, right? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, you know where I'm going with this, with the point I'm about to make. Yeah. So the player who's plus 71 is Andrew Kopp, okay? Andrew Kopp is plus 71 for his career. Jack Eichel is minus 40 for his career. Now... Jack Eichel's career is a perfect example of applying that context. Jack Eichel's first four seasons in Buffalo minus uh, minus sixty, right? Like it's like it's 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 a it's a there's an important context. The his two years his one and a half years, but in Vegas he's plus twenty he's plus twenty nine. Like this is this is a space where you look at the context of how do you apply this? Where if it's a stat. I think this is where it comes into the flaw of things. If it's a stat where, and this is not to take a drive by an Andrew Cop, but if Andrew Cop is statistically that much better than Jack Eichel, it tells you that it's not a stat that we should be using to evaluate who the best players in hockey are. And I think that's, and that to me is where where I come from on this. Completely agree. Could not. Uh... It couldn't agree any more on that. And honestly, that's a great example to highlight. You know, unfortunately, as good as some of these players are, they can't overcome the badness of, of their teams and vice versa. You know, we talk about, I mentioned some of the all time leaders. Uh, another guy that we have to always remember that's up there is Brad McCrimmon, um, who, you know, the beast, he played next to Nick Lidstrom in the later part of his career and certainly had a benefit from that. We always joke that the, the second best defenseman on the Red Wings was the guy who was Nick Lidstrom's partner. And so, you know, it, it, it certainly works out in that way. Um, but folks, that'll do it for us uh, today. A little bit of a shorter episode just to connect with everybody here. We'll be back to you next week. Um, and we've got a couple of exciting guests lined up. And so, as always, if you've got any questions, comments, concerns, please direct those to the direct messages of Ryan Hanna on Twitter. He would be more than happy to address those. Thanks, folks, uh, and thanks for tuning in.